Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to well, welcome you to our panel on the challenge of writing historical fiction. Off. Um, this is uh, the purpose of this panel is um, we all on this panel uh, don't all write the same kind of fiction. Um, I'll let people introduce themselves and go into more detail. But uh, uh, Cecilia Holland is a, uh, I don't know what the right term is it for, you know, uh, straight, traditional, regular, whatever you prefer. You tell me what you prefer, Cecilia. But she writes regular historical fiction of the kind that was immensely popular when I was growing up, but sort of has, for some Frank reason. Irby. Huh? Frank Irby. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was all kinds. Uh, no, Frank no. Irby. Um, uh, Raf uh, Raphael Sabatini, mm -hmm. Thomas yes. Stain, Thomas mm -hmm. Edison, James Michener, of course. Um, Rosemary Sutcliffe. Yeah. yeah. Um, most of the rest of us write, um, uh, among other things, write what's called alternate history, which is historical fiction, but it's where we make changes in history to see what might happen. Um, and David Drake, who is on my upper left, um, doesn't write uh, well, I'll let David describe it, but he, he, all, practically all of his fiction is, is, is rooted in history one way or another. So uh, with no further ado, let me start with the introductions. And Cecilia, why don't we start with you? Oh, my name is Cecilia Holland. I've been writing for a million years, and uh, I started writing historical fiction because when I was writing, I was only 12, and I had no stories in my own. And I discovered that history is just a ton of stories. So I picked them up and started with them. And I love it. I still do it. Steve Sterling? Yeah. Um, well, I've been writing for what now turns out to be an implausibly long period of time. I wrote my first story when I was six. Um, like Cecilia, I, uh, I consider history to be just chock full of like stories and stuff that you just could not make up yourself or at least couldn't get people to believe if you did. Um, it's one of the miracles of our educational system that it makes history seem dull. Um, I wanted to be a history professor, but then found out what you had to do to become a history professor and decided that writing fiction was actually a more secure career path. Um, and uh, yeah, I like, to, I like to play with history. I also like to use history because, well, you know, there's a saying that World building is a good occupational therapy for lunatics who think they're God. Um, <laughs> and uh, history does a lot of your work for you when it comes down to that. David? Okay, um, I, uh, I founded the Sidewise Award for Alternate History back in 1995 when I was a graduate student studying medieval history. Uh, published my first short story in 2008. Mm. It was a medieval history using a very... Um, uh, esoteric branch point. Um, and then earlier this year, I published my first alternate history novel after Hastings with Ring of Fire Press. Marilla? Oh, um, I'm Marilla Sands. My first sale was in uh, 1991. Um, actually, my, my, uh, when I did get an agent in the 90s, she did sell historical fiction for me. I, I do have two books out from Tor. I think they're out of print now. But there's Sky Knife and Serpent and Storm, and they take place in uh, fifth century Central America. Uh, but for now, I'm writing some alternate history that started out uh, in the mid 90s and a friend approached me and said, hey, I know some Civil War reenactors. Do you want to write a TV show? And we'll put it on cable access. I remember back when cable stations had to have cable access and you had to put on local programming. Um, so we wrote a screenplay. We had the same agent. She shopped it around. Um, nobody bought it. It went in the trunk. Uh, so a few years ago, though, I uh, resurrected that and have been publishing that for Ring of Fire Press. So these are alternate history where the Civil War went different. I know that's a, a tipping point in history that a lot of people tend to pick, but we picked it because of the practical uh, reason that my friend Mark, uh, he thought if we had to film this ourselves, he knew the Civil War reenactors. So he could just call people and say, hey, show up a field on the, in the weekend, let's go film some things. Uh, so it was practical, a practical reason for us. David? Um, I write science fiction and fantasy, and I need plots to do this, or it's better to have plots. <laughs> and, uh, well, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but 
using real history is useful and I usually do. And um, doesn't seem to matter to people. Um, I, I started putting in afterwards or forwards in my books when I realized that if I was basing it on something real and I didn't tell people what it was I was basing it on, that they'd get it wrong and tell the world wrong. And, you know, well, that that's life, but um, irritated me. So I, I usually tell the reviewers what the, uh, the setting is, so. That, I was going to say, it, uh, uh, being irritated by people who get it wrong, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just an occupational hazard for being a writer. Uh, uh, I, I have made it a point, which I actually learned from, from David, uh, who was my mentor when I was, uh, I, I sort of learned the trade, not sort of, I did learn the trade largely from David, but and I remember one piece of advice you gave me a long, long time ago, which is don't read reviews, uh, especially yeah. don't, read, don't read reader reviews, especially. Uh, <laughs> and I generally follow that. I do occasionally uh, just more in a lighthearted spirit than anything else, scan through just to see how I, I, I occasionally find reviews that are so bad that I find them amusing. Um, mm -hmm. um, but generally, yeah it's um you're gonna run across a certain number of people and they could even be professional reviewers who are gonna just say something it's not it's not so much that i get upset because they don't like the book i think i did something wrong that's oh, yeah. that's legitimate it's just mm -hmm. stuff that's just moronic and it's like you know I, I remember the specific occasion where you told me this was somebody wrote a review of the first belisarius book in which they denounced us because our knowledge of history was so bad that we used the word hecatontark to refer to a Roman officer instead of centurion. And I almost reply because the, the, the novel is set in the in the sixth century in the mm. Eastern, Eastern Roman Empire when people were speaking Greek and the word for leader of a hundred in Greek is hecatontark, not centurion. And, and David restrained me from... from <laughs> I'm a saint. Huh? I'm a saint. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Cecilia, why uh, you have written, you're sort of the, the traditionalist, I guess I can call it, among us in terms of the kind of, of, of history you write. What, and one of the things I've noticed is that you write in a lot of different periods, um, which uh, is often not true is uh, people who write historical fiction, they tend to stick to fairly limited range of history they try to deal with. And I'm just curious, um, um, we just published a book of years that's set in the Mongol era. And now we're about to, you've got two stories, we're put together one volume that are set in, uh, in well, California, Nevada, in, in the in much, much more recent period. And is it, what is it that, is there anything in particular that leads you to choose any particular period that you write in? Um, I don't know. I, the reason I do this, I think, is because one of my earliest influences was Harold Lamb. I don't mm. know if anybody even remembers Harold Lamb anymore, but he wrote everything <laughs> from history up to the Korean War. And uh, I just like a good, uh, a good narrative. I love narrative, I love to write it, and I love to see a piece of narrative that I can just pick up and run with. Um, and the uh, the thing about the Mongols was that's also uh, a major turning point, huge turning point in history. And uh, it was fun to try to put it into the terms of the people who lived through it, and uh, who experienced it firsthand. That's always the game, is to uh, turn it into something that could actually happen to real people instead of something sitting there on a page. And I just, uh, when I'm, the stories don't, I don't pick stories. They pick me. They come looking for me and grab me and, and say, now you write me or I'm never going to let you alone again. And uh, that's been pretty much the way it works. The books about California are uh, because living in California, I'm constantly bumping into 
uh, the wonderful short history of um, the American occupation of California. Um, these books are set in the 1870s, which was a turbulent, wild time for the entire country. And uh, they sort of embody the kind of uh, uproar, the clash of values, the, um, the uh, real uh, uncertainty and doubt and uh, conflict that you don't get. When they teach you history in school, they teach you as if it's all guys in, in you know, short pants and wigs standing around signing papers. And they, you don't see that it was, a, from the beginning, it was a mess. And uh, the, you know, the book I'm working on now is a, about the revolution. And you want to talk about messes. The first year of the revolution was just chaos. And poor George Washington kept, there's a wonderful scene where um, he's trying to get his men out of New York and they're going north toward Harlem Heights and they start breaking out of columns and just running. And George is trying to turn them and trying to get them to, to set up and face the British who are marching after them. And he finally just gets his gifts up and throws his hat on the ground. And that, that's, you know, the kind of touch that to me really makes real history happen. But the stuff they teach us in school is, you know, not that. Who teaches George Washington as he shows up on the quarter? Not enough, Eric. Steve, how um, about you? Me? Well, Why do I pick one? Which Steve were you talking to? Oh, I'm sorry. Here's the distinction. Uh, you're Steve, Steve, I'm Steven. And he's Steven. That's the way okay. we're going, okay? So you're Steve. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, the similar things. Um, when I when I pick a period to write in, and I, as I said, as you said, I, I usually do alternate history. Um, I like to pick a period where some small thing really moved mountains. Um, Cecilia was talking about the chaos of the American Revolution, and that's true. There was a lot of chaos, um, but if you compare it with, say, the Mexican Revolution leading up to Mexican independence, you can see that by God, God does have is on our side. Because all the things that could go could have went badly wrong didn't, and uh, in Mexico, most of the things that could go badly wrong did, and uh, you know that uh, that had consequences that rolled down the years. Like in the retreat from New York, uh, a British colonel named uh, Ferguson, uh, who was a, a crack <laughs> shot and a, a rifle enthusiast, um, was sniping at the. Um, at the American retreating Americans, and he saw one officer and recognized him as George Washington, and turned and, sh and then moved his rifle and shot the guy next to him because he didn't consider it genteel to shoot a commanding officer. Um, no, seriously, this happened. Yeah, I know. I read that. Yeah, and if he'd shot Washington, my God, I don't think things would have turned out nearly as well. No way. No. <laughs> So I, I pick periods when interesting things are happening or just barely don't happen. Uh, the, the series I'm working on currently uh, centers around the 1912 election, uh, Taft, uh, Woodrow Wilson, and uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And Roosevelt would undoubtedly have won the election if he'd won the nomination, and he was cheated out of the nomination. The old guard used everything, including murder, to, uh, to cheat him out of the nomination. Um, but their basic advantage was that Taft was president. He was on their site. He controlled the levers of patronage, uh, you know, which delegations got seated, that sort of thing. Um, but Taft was a human walrus. He usually weighed at least 340 pounds. When, when Theodore Roosevelt was practicing judo, he was one of the first Americans to study it. He used to have Taft in and they, they practiced together when, when Taft uh, was in his administration and he'd throw him and the whole White House shook um, when he hit the ground. Um, so I just had Taft vapor lock after he lost the uh, primary in Ohio, which was his home state. And uh, that really did send him for a loop. And in this one, he just has a heart attack and dies in his sleep. And, you know, then Roosevelt gets the nomination and goes on to defeat Wilson. Wilson got 42% of the vote and didn't carry a majority in any state that hadn't been a member of the Confederacy, by the way. And he was a terrible president, absolutely terrible. Um, <laughs> Wilson... Uh, uh, Roosevelt uh, had become a bit of a pariah in certain circles by 1912 because he'd become associated with some rather radical ideas. And I thought it would be interesting to see him put them into practice. Also, Wilson was a, was a uh, born ditherer. He hated making difficult decisions. 
Um, his treatment of what happened with, on, along the Mexican border during the Mexican Revolution is an example. He managed to get the worst of both worlds, intervening but doing so half-heartedly, and then, <laughs> then giving up on it. Um, so, you know, you get the Mexicans to hate you, and you accomplish nothing. Um, all right, the Mexicans were going to hate us anyway. Yeah, but Roosevelt would not have done anything half-hearted. And if no. you read his speeches of the time, uh, you know, you'll know what I mean. He wasn't a half-hearted sort of guy. If he did something, he did it all the way. Mm -hmm. um, and usually did it uh, brilliantly. So that's a big uh, turning point. His attitude towards the war in Europe was completely different. Uh, Roosevelt really understood how government worked and Wilson didn't. Wilson's experience had been running Princeton. Um, Roosevelt had been in practical politics since the 1880s. Um, Wilson tried to have the whole general staff fired because they'd drawn up a contingency plan for war with, uh, war with Germany. No, I'm serious. He did, hmm. uh, which shows you just the depth of his understanding. Um, so, you know, I wanted, to, well, I wanted to do Wilson down, frankly, and uh, <laughs> well, he's a, yeah. he's a hero of mine, and I wanted to give him the boost he really deserved. <laughs> so that's why I picked that period. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. That's the issue. Sorry. Uh, Stephen? Yes. Um, well, as I said earlier, I was studying uh, for a master's degree in medieval history. So it's a period that I know quite well, kind of backwards and forwards. And uh, one of the nice things about medieval history is it essentially spends a thousand years to give you to play with. So when I was playing around with the idea of the novel um, after Hastings, I took a look and I was amazed to discover that very few people had actually done anything with the Battle of Hastings, which is a major turning point in uh, European history. Uh, without it, um, it's possible that the English would have remained tied to the Scandinavian countries instead of Western Europe. Um, you know, it just leaves so, mu so much room for uh, exploration. As it happens, one of the few people who have written about it uh, is back in, I think, 2001, an essay appeared uh, on the repulse at Hastings by Cecilia Holland. So, um, <laughs> so, so you know, I, I um, you know, I had a lot of fun writing it. Uh, you know, it was a period that I already knew, but you know, I was also delving deeper into to, to get the details. Um, and you know, my my first short story was set uh, several hundred years later, but also during the medieval period, because again, it's the period that I know best. Um, Although I, I once made a joke to a professor of mine saying one of the things I like about studying medieval history is it's history. It's not journalism. If you have newspapers, it's journalism, you know, it, as primary sources, which, you know, it, it's a very flippant and, and not true attitude towards history. And the professor I was talking to, who was a, um, a Roman historian, looked at me and said, well, you know, what you're studying is practically modern. So, <laughs> you know, a lot of it is uh, perspective, you know, and you know, as David said, there are so many stories that you can just steal entirely. Um, that, you know, when you put them on the page, you know people aren't going to believe because the coincidences in them just are too unbelievable. Um, you know, but you can say this really happened, you know, this, you know, and you could show them the sources if you wanted to. Bro. <laughs> Well, I wrote my historical fiction um, because, uh, and set with the Maya in, in, in Central America, because in third grade, we did this, his, this like history thing, and it was on the Maya, and I just found out so interesting, so that, you know, 20 years later, when I'm thinking, what kind of historical period, because I've always loved history, uh, do I want to start researching and reading lots of books on and, and everything? Um, the Maya popped up in my head, and I just went in with that. But I think to me, you know, as a few other people have said, there's just so many stories and there are things that you can look at from different perspectives because you can read it the way you learned it in school, right? But is that going to be not necessarily the most interesting or, or the most accurate? You know, um, I had a professor in college who said that nobody could say anything bad about King John to him because King John got him his doctorate. Uh, so, you know, he had a different perspective than you would get, say, from watching a movie about Richard the Lionheart and John would be this skulking, you know, evil guy in the background or whatever. Uh, so just looking at different parts of history and different people who play these roles and the things that happen that you don't learn in school, 
Uh, I just always loved it. And the older it is, the more I love it. If I go to Britain and I have the option to say, see something that's from the Tudor era and something from the Roman era, then I'm going to head up toward the Romans. But if I have the option to see, say, the Romans versus the Neolithic, then I'm going to be running to the Neolithic. I want to know more about that, that time period. So um, I hope to set a novel someday in the Neolithic. Uh, I've been kind of researching it, but there's an awful lot of other books I have to do, including the ones. Cecilia's that done that too, you know. Hmm? Yeah. Cecilia's done that with Stonehenge. Well, not specifically Stonehenge I'm looking at, but uh, if you read anything about Herxheim, that that's really fascinating. There apparently we the in the past ten years uh, the archaeologists who were looking at Herxheim uh, discovered that it was like this five to ten year period where the people in just this one settlement ate like a thousand other people, um, but none of the other towns around them have the same kind of pits of human bones that show evidence of of being eaten. So it's like what happened to this one town? Why them and not their neighbors? Who were they eating? Why? I mean, it just, you want to know, right? Because it, it's not the whole society. It's just these, this one town. So, you know, I'd like to research that. And if so I research enough, then I'd like to write a book about it. That's the story that's grabbed you. Mm -hmm. Not you were looking for it, but it came looking for you. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more research on that. See I if there were any bottles of chili sauce in the pits. Hmm? I said, see if there were any bottles of chili sauce in those pits. <laughs> yeah, right. David, you, have a, uh, you don't exactly pick an historical period to write about. What you do is plunder history. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, basically. Uh, 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 and I know you, in particular, are are uh, uh, prone to plundering us using um, Roman history um, yeah. in particular. And, and I, in, I, I sometimes think I said to a friend of mine, I said, well, you got to understand, David Drake knows so much Roman history that he can find episodes there that, that nobody except a handful of scholars know about. And so, you know, nobody can can fault them, but then you write a forward or afterward and you give it all away. Um, but uh, what is in particular that, that draws you to any one period or any one thing to use as a basis? I mean, you're going to wind up writing usually a science fiction novel, sometimes fantasy, but what draws yeah. you in particular? Um, wide cam canvas, and you have some very good um, historians covering a wide period. And if I want to pick something in 200 BC, you know, the Rhodes Byzantium War, uh, I can find that. And there's not really a hell of a lot known in the, the wider, you know, human perspective. Um, about that sort of thing, and it gives me range. Um, I used one, um, the whole Coriolanus subject in Rome was interesting because the Roman historians on it uh, were treating that as a myth, really. Um, this, this wonderful heroic figure who is badly treated by his own people and um, is comes back to conquer Rome, but is turned away from this by his mother. Uh, you know, very romantic situation. And it's almost certainly myth, but there were real um, examples of that sort of thing in the period um, situation at Cumi at a little later was very much that sort of thing, and that's what happened. And uh, you know, that's that's an interesting subject to uh, to pick from. A um, lot of stuff available. So. Uh, in, in my case, somebody asked me once, what, you know, what led me to pick, because I've been in, I've written stories set in the Thirty Years' War, Jacksonian America, uh, 
late Roman Empire, sixth century, the Alexandrian period. And people ask me, what leads you to pick one or another? And, and, and more often than not, the answer is, well, I got commissioned to do it. Um, I had never thought of writing a book about Belisarius until after I published my first novel through Bain Books. Jim Bain asked me, he said, uh, would you like to do uh, a trilogy, as it then was, uh, with David Drake on... Uh, and David um, Drake plotted the trilogy. David Drake plotted a trilogy, and David has never stopped <laughs> he told me that if he had actually been the one to write it, it would have stayed a trilogy, which I'm yep. quite sure it would have. David and um, I are not the same writer. Hmm. Uh, in my defense, what happened was that when David plotted, he had left the background of the the Indians and African characters off stage because he didn't know who was going to wind up writing the story, and he didn't really want to run hmm. them if they screwed up. But as it happens, I got my master's degree in African history and I know a lot mm. of Indian history. So I said, do you mind if I fill in the background? He said, no, go ahead. So that's really what expanded the story more than anything else. But that's how I did that one. And the reason I wound up writing a Sam Houston book was because uh, Steve Saffel at Del Rey approached me and, you know, with a specific project. And I said, sure. Although I didn't do it. The Let's way do 1632 for Del Rey. Right. Well, I and actually had originally designed 1632 for Del Rey because they'd approached me for all the history novel and then they dilly dally and couldn't make up their mind and I offered it to Jim Bain, assuming Jim wouldn't want it because the heroes are trade unionists. And he then called me on the phone about seven in the morning. He said, this is the best idea you've ever come up with. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh Christ, because I've offered it. Del Rey still has Mm -hmm. it. And so I had to explain to Dave, to, to uh, Jim that I'd actually designed it for Del Rey. He got mad at me um, because he considered me his author, which was fair enough. I was, but I pointed out to him, I assumed you wouldn't like it because the heroes are trade unionists and I'm not changing that. He said, no, no, of course not. And I said, Jim, you're, you're a right wing Republican. You don't like trade unions. And he said, well, coal miners are different. Um, so I learned, I, I, that was my first lesson in the fact that Jim Bain was not always predictable. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, you called me and, huh? He called me and said, we got somebody to write your Belzarius series. Yeah. And uh, he's a commie. <laughs> I remember, when you, I remember when I called you, the first thing I get was, oh, the Trotskyite, you know? Um, yeah. yeah, I will say this for Jim. Um, my agent, now you got to understand, I had never sold anything. This is my first book sale. And my agent called me and said that Jim Bain was interested in buying Mother of Demons, but he wants to talk to you. So I said, okay. I called him up and Jim wanted to talk politics. He wanted to talk about the book because he could mm -hmm. figure out from reading the book that I didn't have his political view of things, but he couldn't figure out what it was because it didn't seem like a liberal either. Um, so <laughs> I told him, well, you know, David's known me now for many, many years and mm -hmm. Dave, you've known me a long time too. So I said, well, give me 10 minutes. I'll sketch out my whole political history. And he said, go ahead. So I did. Because I didn't say any, I mean, I'm not going to play games with it. It's you mm. know, a social political act as a trade union for 30 years. You know, that's where I come from. Um, and when I was done, we talked for about two hours. And at the end, he said, well, I guess if John Campbell could get along with Mac Reynolds, I can get along with you. Uh, and that's when he decided to buy the book. And that's when he offered me the, uh, you know, the Belisarius series. Um, Jim was... Uh, he was quite a guy, and uh, there there were things about him that drove me crazy. There, of course, there were things about Jim drove everybody I know crazy. But but he was uh, somebody I got to be friends with, and uh, and to this day have a great deal of respect for. And that was part of it, is that you know, and he stuck to it too. Mm. Anyway, but to to go back to where I theoretically started, um, what will draw me to a to something. Like, for instance, the Belisarius series, I took the project because, you know, I was offered to me. 
at the beginning of my career and I wasn't an idiot. I wasn't gonna turn down a chance to do a collaboration with David Drake. But what really made- You did it, a good plot. Huh? I did a good plot. Uh, it had a really good plot. Um, um, as I discovered, because I, I keep trying to page it, and I would discover that, that well, no, as actually a reason David did it, yeah. he did it, that actually works and might change isn't going to work. It was, a, it was an education. Um, but what actually made that series gel for me was when I was, I was reading your outline, and I, and I finally realized what you had done was that it was the sort of aliens of the futures who were the, the good guys and the humans who were the bad guys. And, and that's when I figured out, okay, I can see where there's a, a the, re, the point to this is what I need to tell a story is, is figure out, all right, what's the conflict and do I care about it? Mm. And if there is, then I can tell a story. If there's not, then, you know, there's just not a story there for me. And that's usually whether it's a story I get commissioned or I don't want to figure out on my own. It's, uh, it's usually that's where I start. It's not so much the particular period. Oh, except I do have one ironclad rule. I will never write historical fiction set in the Civil War, the Second World War, or in the Napoleonic era because I don't want to deal with a million goddamn nitpickers pestering me because I got the wrong number of rows of buttons on the uniform. You know, I just- Absolutely. Uh, one of the things I like about the Thirty Years' War is there's only one reenactors group in America. It's in Wisconsin, and I made friends with them early on. Um, so I just don't have to deal with that level of, of pestering. Um, what I wanted, to, what do you find, and Cecilia, I'll start with you again. Um, what do you find is the biggest challenge to writing historical fiction? Um, finding the real story. Uh, the thing about history is that you get great facts, you get great data some of the time, but to make the story work, it has to be about particular people. And that has to be a very strong story line where you won't, for one thing, you won't be able to get it to end. And uh, finding the characters and finding out what they are really uh, doing, why the history matters to them, what, well, not history, why the events that are they're taking place around them matter to them and how they respond to it. And making that feel like it's happening to real people uh, is the real hard part. The rest of it, there is so much data in that. You can go on the internet and find anything. When I did um, Heart of the World, there was enormous amounts of data right there at my fingertips about what, oh God, millions of years ago, I wrote another book about the Mongols and there was no data. There was nothing. The secret history hadn't been translated into English. Uh, I couldn't get to Mongolia. Uh, there was nothing. Uh, so a lot of it was just full of holes. But now with the internet, you've got everything. And uh, it was, you've got all these Arab chronicles. There's Arab reenactments of the Battle of Angelut, which, you know, the reenactments weren't really very good, but they're, you know, at least something happening. And so, you know, it's the data. But the main character, getting the two main characters to actually get up and walk off the page was the hard part. It always is. Steve, how about you? Um, well, I'm a born uh, detail freak and uh, nitpicker myself. And <laughs> I, I find that I tend to bury myself in research unless I'm, uh, unless I'm for, unless I forcibly restrain myself. When I wrote my first, post-apocalyptic science fiction novel. At one point, I was crawling around the floor of my apartment, which I had covered with an improvised map of my far future North America, and I was tracing out the, the routes by which raw flax moved in, uh, in trade caravans. <laughs> and I, I was doing this, and I said to myself, Steve, stop. Write the book. <laughs> um, and, you know, that was, that was good advice. The other thing is that to write a good story, you've got to get people involved with the characters. They've got to be people with important things at stake and people have got to care about the characters. Um, the downside to this is that, you know, there's an old saying that most aliens in science fiction aren't actually as alien as someone from Japan. Um, uh, you know, they may have tentacles, but underneath it, that they're from Pasadena. Um, and that's, that's a, a real handicap because you know the past is another country they do things differently there people are different 
if you go back far enough in the past. Um, if you go back a short distance, they're different in ways that just irritate the hell out of people today. If you go back a long distance, they're like got really alien views of the world, moral reflexes. C.S. Lewis one that you got to remember that if someone, an educated man in 1200 looked up at the sky, he didn't see distant suns. He saw lights in a crystal sphere pushed by angels. Right. Um, that's true. Um, and Mary Renault, who's a really good historical novelist who I've, I've always liked, had a scene in one of her books set in, in classical Athens. And it's during the time of the 30 tyrants after Athens has lost the Peloponnesian War. Um, his father has gotten on the, out, on the outs with the 30 they sent guys to murder him. His son comes across him and he's dying and he takes him in his arms. And his father's last words are, avenge my blood. And uh, Alexius, the protagonist, who we've seen as a, a student of philosophy and uh, a young man who's often at odds with his father, says, father, how do you think I could be so base of soul as to forgive my enemies? And it's a, it's a beautiful moment of realization. You know, we're talking about someone who we've come to like, really identify with as a person to whom vengeance is not a temptation to be resisted. It's a moral obligation. And, you know, that's going to color everything he does from then on. And uh, Renaud said, said at one point when she was writing uh, another one set in Syracuse during Plato's time, that uh, Christianity and Islam had changed the moral reflexes of humankind. And that, you know, writing before that before they came along was a real challenge. And I've, I've always felt that that, um, that is something you've got to do because making people in the remote past too much like people today is lazy. I, I just find it distasteful. But on the other hand, it's a real challenge to make identifiable characters out of people who are that different. Dave, well, David? Well, Cecilia and Steve both took the, the easy and good ones. Um, I mean, you know, that's where I was going to start out, getting myself into the mindset of people who actually live, but their view of the day-to-day -day world is so amazingly different from my own. And the fact that doing research is fun. Um, so I'm actually going to jump off of the doing research is fun part. And one of the more difficult parts for me is when you're doing your research and you come across a hole, um, you know, something that we don't have an answer. We don't know how things were done. We don't know what happened. We don't know how people viewed things. And you have to patch that hole for the book or the story in a way that's realistic. You want to um, show respect for the culture and the people you're writing about, but you need to get the story done. And so figuring out how to fill up that hole that exists, um, I think is one of the harder parts because, you know, yeah, that's fun. You get to use your imagination but it always feels a little bit wrong because, you know, in my case, I'm so in-depth into the research that I'm doing that uh, making something up in that particular case always seems uh, to be a little bit off. And uh, the, the, one of the projects I'm working on right now is a story about um, an Akkadian god. And um, there are a lot of holes in our, in our knowledge of the Akkadians. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say there was basically a, a large hole in well, our knowledge of the Akkadians. Now, to be but, fair, it's really not so much of a hole. It's you have this big chasm with one little rock in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to build a platform out to that rock. <laughs> Morella, what about you? Well, I think um, that they, they pretty much what everyone else has said. I mean, you want to, you want your characters to be relatable. People need to, you know, follow them to the book and not just put the book down. At the same time, they have to be alien enough that they feel like they belong to that culture. Um, so trying to find that line. Uh, when I wrote Sky Knight, which takes place you know, in Tikal in the fifth century, so my main character is a priest and he does cut out people's hearts at the top of the temple. Um, you know, my mother read the draft and she's like, I could never kill anybody. And I was like, well, I didn't kill anybody, but you know, my main character does kill people within certain parameters, and he thinks that's perfectly okay because of his culture and his religion. So you have to somehow walk that line. And I would think also, I guess I'll mention that, you know, when you're doing your research, being able to distinguish good information from not so good information um, is, is important. I had a discussion with somebody some years ago on online, um, and they were really pushing something and, and I was like, I don't, I don't think that's right. And then so I'm like, they, and they were really going for it. So I'm, I said, well, where'd you get that information? And they, and they told me, 
And I, I turned out the library a mile from my house, had a copy of that book on the shelf. So I just drove over, I opened up the book. Yes, sir, not, sure enough, there's that fact that this person has in their text. And then I see that it's footnoted. And then I look down at the footnote and the person's actually quoting a work of fiction. And it's like, that, that it's not, it's not historical. Someone made that up. This is, this is a fictional book that they're, you know, so yes, it looks like it's got a footnote and it looks really official, but this is not historical for your work, you know? So being able to distinguish good information is also very important. Unless you're doing, I guess, a book on bad information, in which case you want to find that stuff. But uh, assuming you actually want to be historically accurate, then you have to be able to be discerning. Uh, I had an interesting case of that when I was reading Aurelius Victor. Uh, there was the uh, a description of a famous uh, case where the Roman Empire was actually purchased by a rich man, um, and uh, he replaced the emperor who'd been assassinated uh, and that the the fellow who had done this I mean you know really horrible act uh, was in fact one of the greatest jurists of his time this is in Aurelius Victor in the original um, then I checked and no that's wrong uh, he was the nephew of the very famous jurist, you know, one of the five great jurists of the Roman Empire. Uh, getting an original source, and Aurelius Victor is a pretty original source, um, will tell you what people or some people thought at the time, but it's still bullshit. <laughs> and, you know, this is an important thing to know, that getting it right doesn't always mean following an original source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I know for myself, it's easily the most, I'll call it the trickiest thing about writing this historical fiction, you know, is the whole problem of, of of you, you want to make it accurate or at least pl you know plausible, um, but on the other hand, um, there's enough differences between the 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 mores we'll call it of the modern audience and and the period mm. we're talking about that it's um, it's a little bit difficult. I remember once David talking to you when you you wrote I think it was Cross the Stars. Is that the the, the novel you wrote? That's a, a science fictional version of of the uh, the Odyssey. Yeah. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I remember you telling me you had to you know you had to clean it up because yeah. you know I mean yeah. the first thing it, the it, the real hero does if you read the Odyssey as they're sailing away from Troy, first thing they do is plunder a village. Uh, uh, this is a hero, uh, and and then it goes on and on, and at the end, you know, he winds up murdering all the maids who, you know, were basically forced okay. into having sex with the suitors, and not like they had any choice in the matter, but he hangs all of them. And you know, the, oh. by minor standards, the, this is your hero, seriously. Yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, I, I, by the way, Shelley, I, I have to tell you, I thought you did a brilliant job with the Mongols at Heart of the World. Uh, of just being able to depict. I worked to some degree with Mongols in my first novel, not directly, but I would use them as a reference. And they had this bizarre sort of combination of a certain kind of egalitarianism, which was quite striking. Um, when when Timujin's wife was kidnapped and held and, and you know and, and raped and they she winds up having a child, which was pretty certainly not Genghis Khan's own. He just accepted it as an own because he said, you know, it's his fault that she got captured. It wasn't her fault. I mean, boy, there's all kinds of cultures where that would not have been the reaction to it. Um, and, you know, the Mongols practice religious tolerance. There are all things I like, a lot of things to really like about the Mongols. At the same time, they can be just unbelievably ruthless. Absolutely, and yeah. And murderous. And 
And just the way you depicted the young Jewish girl who gets brutalized in the conquest of Baghdad, but then winds up being taken in by, uh, you know, the household of, of, of Balagu Khan. I thought it was just, it, it's a wonderful example of how you can walk that line. Um, let's put it that way, you know, of, of not, not Being seduced. I'm sorry? Seduced into the service of the of Dokas, the Katsum, because Dokas thinks she can use her. She becomes affectionate toward her and likes her. But from the beginning, she's trying to turn this world because she wants to use her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, what I wanted to show was that the Mongols were considerably more sophisticated than, you know, just hairy brutes. And, uh, but the, their idea that their God sent them to fix the world is not, you know, is, it's there in their own history, in the secret history, you see that. But you also see it in the 1950s United States. And that was, you know, I took that wholeheartedly to, you know, show why they thought they could get away, why it was okay to, you know, massacre everybody in a city just because one guy dies. It's God's on your side. <clears throat> the oh, the sky, yeah. Note there that the classical and Hellenistic Greeks had a lot of the same problems with Homer that we do, or not all the same problems, but some of the same problems. And the, their whole mythology got crystallized at a state that was considerably less intellectually sophisticated than they became later. And it was a big problem for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, I, I started a, a new author in history series a few years back, um, which to be perfectly honest is because I was on a cruise and it struck me that a cruise ship would make a great location for an author in history novel. And so I wound up planning the cruise ship in the Mediterranean two years after the death of Alexander the Great mm -hmm. in the age of the Diodaci, which is a period in history that makes Game of Thrones look pretty tame. Uh, <laughs> and, and so you, you plant this modern cruise ship with a largely elderly, you know, I mean, anybody that's ever been on a cruise knows that, you know, the, most of, not all, but most of the people on cruise, the staff are very young, but, but you know, the passengers tend to be, uh, you know, well, first of all, they have to have a certain amount of money. And secondly, they have to have a certain amount of time, which means they're often retired. So it was made for a nice combination, but the single biggest trick for me is figuring out a protagonist or or several protagonists that I can live with, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, because writing a novel, and I'm a pretty fast writer, but writing a novel takes months. And if it then turns into a series, you're talking years. And I really don't want to live with a character that, that I find basically pretty nauseating. Um, and, <laughs> and so, you know, it's a trick to find. I remember when Jim Bain offered me the Belisarius series, part of the reason I agreed to do it, I probably, to be honest, would have agreed, even if he'd wanted me to write one about Attila the Hun. But because uh, I was the beginning. I bet that would have been interesting. Yeah, I know it would have. Uh, but the thing about Belisarius was that as, as generals of the era went, his reputation wasn't actually, you know, there's a lot of good things to be said about him, mm -hmm. which is the reason he's had such a good press in science fiction over the years. Um, and when I did the, uh, the, the period set in Jacksonian era, I work a lot with Andrew Jackson, but I would have found it very hard to have him as my central character. Um, I mean, there's a lot of mythology about Jackson today, which is quite unfair, but the reality remains, he was a, a harsh, often brutal, callous bastard. There's no other way to put it. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a lot to be said about him as positive, but um, I, I didn't really want to live inside that head for too long. And so I, I hunted around and I needed a Southern politician. And I found Sam Houston and Sam Houston is very, very likable. Um, <laughs> for all kinds of reasons. So that's why I wound up making him the central protagonist among white people. Um, but that's the trick to it, is finding a character I can work with. And part of the reason, one of the things I like about author history is if I occasionally, as I did with the, the Jacksonian period, it's, it's pure author history, there's no time travel element. But usually I have a time travel element of one kind or another. 
and that allows me to bring in a modern perspective. So you've got at least some modern viewpoint of what's happening that, you know, you can sort of work back and forth and, and make it uh, work better for the audience. But that's what I find is the single, if there's any single trick to writing historical fiction is keeping your, your, your characters plausible. You know, I mean, you're not, just writing fantasy about what people in the Middle Ages would have been like, but at the same time, it's something that your audience, you know, can get involved in and care about the characters. Um, and it can be tricky, um, but I think that's, that's for me at least, that's always the way I have to approach it. Um, is there any um, thing you find particularly difficult about writing historical fiction? I think I may have just asked the reverse question of what we've just been talking about, but I'm just curious. So, or to put it another way, are there any historical periods you would stay away from or characters you wouldn't want to deal with? The one Civil time. War, somebody said. Huh? The Civil War, somebody said, it's just impossible. Everybody knows everything. And they don't care about the story. They just want to zap you. So I would never do anything about the Civil War. Yeah, I mean, reading for these alternate the, for the Sidewise Award for the last uh, 25 years, I have read so many Civil War stories, so many World War II stories, and every year I comment, I don't ever want to read another one, but of course we do, and the one thing I will say is that every few years, somebody does write something that surprises us, and it's extremely good, and we wind up giving the award to it because it's, you know, in our opinion, one of the best things out there, but I, I get so sick and tired of reading about the Civil War and World War II. Mm -hmm. Of course, that raises the problem that when you're writing alternate history, you need the audience to know something at least about the period. Right. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, the first story I published was extremely esoteric. And when it was purchased, I, I wrote a note to the editor saying, would you like me to write a sidebar so people have a clue about what's going on? And his response was, it doesn't matter to me if they know the real history or the fake history, as long as the story is good. And if the story wasn't good, they wouldn't have bought it. So I never did. With alternate, with uh, After Hastings, when it came out, I got a call from my sister saying, I'm really enjoying it, but I have no clue what really happened. So I started to put together some articles and, and a small little website that explains what really happened and who some of the characters were and, and things like that. And uh, you know, she wrote back to me saying, that's fantastic, thank you. It's exactly what I was looking for. But again, you should be able to enjoy the story for what it is. And if it's enjoyable enough, you'll start doing your own research to figure out what actually happened. There is one advantage, which I discovered writing the Belisari series is that there are advantages to writing in a period where really not all that much is known. <laughs> uh, but be, honestly, because, you know, it's like, you know, prove me wrong. Uh, and I'm also, I, when I wrote one of the books, 1632 series, it takes place in, um, in Venice, it's called the Galileo Fair, and and my co-author Andrew Dennis and I made sure that every single location in the novel that was of importance was someplace that was later destroyed. Um, you know, Mussolini <laughs> raised it or to build a railroad uh, station or whatever. So you know, it's like prove me wrong. Um, but um, so it's kind of a trade-off. I mean, there are advantages to writing in. Um, the most modern I think I've done is the Jacksonian era, and there's a lot of historical stuff. It's not like the Civil War, but that's mostly just because it doesn't draw the same amount of... Uh... I find the problem isn't so much that people know too much, it's that they think they know a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and they may know a whole lot about exactly, you know, how the campfire was made. But that doesn't mean they they understand. I mean, I I've gotten in arguments with reenactors who will swear to you that slavery was not the cause of the Civil War. And, <laughs> and, and it's like, yeah, okay. Um, I really don't care how knowledgeable you are, how, how many buttons were on the uniform of of the Iron Regiment. I just don't care because you obviously have no idea what was happening. Um, so I don't know. It's I. I think that a period where people know about it, but don't know much about it, which for Americans, 30 years war is great for that, um, mm -hmm. 
they will tend to take your word for it. If Except you do your research it. carefully, one reason I think it's very important for, for writers of historical fiction to do their research meticulously and carefully is because it will impart a sense of veracity and, and authenticity to your story that readers can sense it, whether they know anything or not themselves, they'll tend to sense it. Um, and uh, that said, Steve, I have to tell you, I have often told new writers in some classes I've given that the two greatest ways for writers to procrastinate is world building and research. Uh, and that's not to say that you don't need to do world, world building and that you don't need to do research, but at a certain point, <laughs> it just becomes an excuse to never sit your ass down and write the goddamn book. Uh, you know, and for one thing, once you start writing, you'll get a better sense of what it is you actually, because you'll still do research, you'll still need to, but you have a better mm -hmm. sense of what. Um, we are coming toward the close of our hour. Um, so does anyone, have anything you'd like to bring up or? Yeah, uh, about how much fun it can be to write historical fiction and alternate hi history. Um, when, when Mark and I are originally doing, looking at the world that is currently in the Ring of uh, Fire Press books, it, it was just to sit around and, and say, hey, if something happened differently in history, then you're like, who's the next president of the United States or what happened for World War I or if World War I went differently because the United States never entered it, then what happened to World War II? Did it even happen? And just to have those kind of conversations over lunch is just it's a lot of fun to do. Amen. Yeah, I think I bring up a technical point. I found that the higher the rank you promote your character to, the harder it is to make their life interesting. Oh yeah, no, no, no. yeah, no, absolutely. Like I, I wrote this alternate history, and Teddy Roosevelt figures prominently in it, but I keep him to the prologue and the epilogue, because what presidents and kings do is mostly chair meetings and listen to reports, and it is really hard to make that fascinating. Now, I uh, there's a reason why I had Mike Stearns, the, the insofar as there's a hero of the 1632 series, there's a reason I had him lose the election so he was no longer prime minister so I could, you know, go have him do something. Otherwise, he's just sitting at a desk. I mean, that's the reality of it. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, there's a reason that, that they tend to, it's a whole lot easier to write about junior or mid-grade officers than it is to write about generals. That's the truth of it. Uh, One of the problems is that the two years I spent around, you know, uh, company grade officers, probably the two worst years of my life. <laughs> and, you know, I, that's, that's the truth, but it, it causes a degree of uh, um, how shall I put it? Uh, <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> yes, that will do. Yeah, yeah I. Uh, yeah, there are some stories I will never write uh, for, for somewhat similar reasons. Just mm -hmm. so that no, I don't really need to go back there. Uh, all right. Um, I believe we're out of time. Um, I haven't gotten a signal from Alexi, but I've been keeping track myself. So listen, um, um, thank you all very much for coming. And I will be seeing Steve, you're on another panel mm -hmm. that uh, I will be seeing you at. Um, and no, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. This has been an interesting experience organizing this virtual convention. Um, <laughs> It's uh, trickier than it looks. Um, um, but one thing I've actually found is I, in a lot of ways, I prefer this kind of discussion than a mm -hmm. traditional molecular panel where you got all the authors lined up in a row at a table because. Yeah. And, and their individual books up in front of them. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't. I don't do that. I don't do it either. I, I just think it's. Um, uh, it I, I think what you're really audience. doing is just putting up a sign saying you never heard of me. Um, mm. and, and
and you know, and that may be the case that they never heard of you, but I just assume not rubbing in myself. <laughs> uh, that's just me. It's partly my temperament. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, I make jokes about it. if I had to make a living marketing, I'd starve to death, uh, you know. Uh, anyhow, um, so thank you again. <laughs>